Hello everyone and welcome to Shannon Q. I am Shannon Q and I have an incredibly gracious guest with me today, so you guys have to be kind to him, but he knows that he is he's gloves off. He doesn't have to be kind to me. We've already set the ground rules because I was late. I was late. So hopefully I'm at least starting with sound today. Maybe I can get something right. This is the, the fastest I've ever put up a live stream in my life because there was 0% chance, 0% chance I was missing the opportunity to talk to this guy. So I'm going to bring him on the screen without further ado because everybody's sick of listening to me. It's Dr. Joel Batten, guys. Look, I got him. I got him. And I excite. Not, I'm so excited and sl still slightly fl flustered on account of I was late and he was gracious enough to accommodate me anyway as I panicked and put up this stream. So if he's mean to me, just let it happen. Encourage him because I deserve it. That's all I'm saying. So hi, Dr. Batten. Thank you for joining us. Everybody can see you now. Why don't you tell everybody who you are and where they can find you and what you're all about? Uh, cool. Uh, I teach uh, at Yale University, and I teach uh, Hebrew Bible, and that's where you can find me, also on Twitter, probably, uh, regularly. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, look, there's no, that's all there is to me. I teach Hebrew Bible at Yale. Now you go. <laughs> well, I'm Shannon Q, and I, uh, I don't teach anybody anything. Uh, unless it's accidentally. <laughs> and I'm in Nova Scotia, and this is my channel, and today we are going to talk about the documentary hypothesis. I was introduced to, do to Dr. Baden by watching um, my friend, John Steingard's YouTube channel and podcast and listening, and you were on there, and it's usually a dry subject matter for me to listen to people talk about Old Testament and even New Testament studies. Like I'm interested in the topic, but it can get a little bit difficult to dredge through. But I found you and your personality made the subject matter more engaging. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. So I decided that I should invite you here and then snub you and make you wait for me like a diva <laughs> so that you could share that with my audience, because I think that you have a you have a way about you of just making these topics um, come to life in a way that prior I hadn't been exposed to. It was mostly, I mean, you, you hang out with the academics, you're at Yale. Some of them are pretty dry. You have to admit that, right? And they're delivering. Most of them. Most of them. I mean, most, most of them. All yeah. right. Well, I'm going to take some questions from the audience at the end. So I know that they're going to be chomping at the bit to ask questions. But initially, what I wanted to do was just see if you could do it. Because when you were on John's podcast, you said that you, you, you've talked about it so much that you could potentially summarize the documentary hypothesis in under a minute. Let's see. Let's see if you've honed that skill. So, are, are yeah. you keeping the clock? Because I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna watch. This. I'm looking. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch. All right. So, what's the documentary okay. hypothesis, Doctor Ben? Here we go. Uh, when you pick up the Bible and you open the first pages, yeah, uh, you read the creation account, right? Like the famous Genesis one creation account, seven days, and like you know God, uh, you know rests on the seventh day and all that, and you're like cool, I understand what's happening here. God created the world in seven days and like in this order, right? Like first the light and the dark and it was good and then this and then that and the other and then God ends, right? Creating uh, humans on day six. And then he's like, I think that's probably enough for this week and he stops. And then you get to the next chapter and it's like, back when the world was created, uh, there was nothing. And then God created like uh, a garden, uh, cre created like one dude from the ground and put him in a garden. And you're like, wait a second, God created men and women just a second ago. And where did all the animals go? And you know, like everything that I thought I knew is turned upside down. And that's because those two creation stories were written by two different people and have been smushed together in our uh, current Bibles. And if you follow like the strand of like the logic of the creation of Genesis one and the logic of the creation of Genesis two, they don't just stop there. They each continue on into other chapters sequentially um, sort of weaving back and forth and in and out. And then eventually a third voice comes in with like a totally different understanding of how things happen. And then you're the three of those are doing their thing for like four books of the Bible. Then you get to Deuteronomy, the fifth one. And it's like a totally different person is writing. And that's the documentary hypothesis. Four authors 
who each wrote stories uh, that are now included in our uh, in, in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books. But each of their stories has been like interwoven, like enmeshed like this by somebody who said, I don't want four stories. I just want one and I'm going to put them all together. How did I do? Uh, you, you were you were over a minute, but not by much. You nailed it. Okay, actually. hold on. I'm going to do, do it again, but less than fewer words. <laughs> okay. No, one. Okay. okay, so... Yeah. Can we, we're not live, right? I can delete that. We're absolutely live, but yeah, you can believe right, it if right. you would like to. That's okay. okay. I'm not, I can't stop you. Um, so I actually had that experience that it, like when I read the Bible the first time, and as most believers do, they read the Bible the first time or not at all, like late in life, right? Usually you kind of get bits of it dictated to you and that's your understanding of it. I think that's a common experience for most people. They don't actually pick it up and read it cover to cover. And if they do pick it up and read it, it's usually selective passages kind of based on a reading study or something. But when I actually did pick it up, that experience hit me and I didn't know what to do with it. And I hadn't heard this documentary hypothesis, but I was never about infallibility, right? I didn't think that the, I wasn't, you know, a young earth creationist or a biblical inerrantist. I, Believed evolution was fine, all of that stuff, right? I just very much believed in God. And the Adam and Eve thing is the first thing that hit me. I remember picking up the Bible and going, wait. And I, I, I what? what? <laughs> they, but they were just there. So had I found you back then, I would have had a better understanding. Because initially, I was just like, okay, well, then this is all wrong. Like the, something. To be fair, right. it is all wrong. Well, I know. <laughs> Like that, that was probably, that was probably like categorically the wrong way to <laughs> like, Fair. is this right or wrong? Like it's all, it's all wrong. It's just, it's internally inconsistent. But I didn't yeah. have a, like, I didn't have an understanding and I still am developing the understanding of how the book itself was constructed. And I think that that's fascinating and that's worth knowing more about rather, mm -hmm. than, especially because it is part of history. I think a lot of times atheists, uh, uh, you know, people like me, Canadians and atheists, they tend to, um, just kind of want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and not look at it as a valuable historical document that should be researched and understood so that you can understand the context of the society at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they tend to just say, okay, well, it's all fables essentially. And thus it's, it can be discarded as, as the mythology of a specific people without looking at how it's constructed and how it affected those societies. So um, you you helped me understand that a little bit better, so thank you for that. Um, sure, um, anytime. <laughs> perfect. Um, so I have I have a couple of questions for you. One, the, my first question is, um, when it comes to the different sources, how do historians and 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 scholars? How did they come to the determination that they were those four separate sources and what types of sources those are? Because those sources all have individual names and they seem to have genres that are affiliated with them as well. Is that based on the type of writing that was done at the time that they compared uh, the style of those authors to? Or is it more so based on just the, the general history in the area? How did they come to the determination of who was a, what author and why? Like, so we want to... Remember, we're not doing anything here other than looking at a piece of literature. Right. Right. So it's not even, you could, it doesn't matter in a sense when it was written. If this was written 200 years ago, we would be able to do all the same things with it. Right? Because it's as if you were to pick up, um, if you somehow had a book that was like a smushed up uh, Shakespeare and also... Um, Stephen King and also Faulkner and also James Joyce, mm -hmm. even like you, you would, you would be able to tell, right? <laughs> you'd, yeah. you'd recognize, yeah. you'd recognize that, oh, like the, the style changes, but also they're just telling different stories. Okay. Um, and uh, so the way that we talk about, you know, their, their names of them or the names are, we just invented. We don't actually know because isn't one priestly? Am I think? Am I remembering right. that incorrectly? Right. Yeah, we, we, we call it we call it priestly because all of its content is about most of its content is about the priests, right? Okay. It's the one responsible for that big chunk of ritual, you know, sacrificial stuff in the middle in Leviticus that nobody likes or reads except for me. <laughs> um, but you know, we call it priestly just based on its characteristics, right? It seems to be really concerned with issues to do with 
the priesthood. So very creatively, we were like, I don't know, well, let's call it like the, the priest source, the, the priestly source. So again, that's not, that's not something that's, it's not some sort of secret revelation of any kind. It's just, you know, we needed to come up with a descriptive title for the thing. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, the way that we know that there, how do we know that there are four? We know there's four because as I was just said in my one slightly longer than one minute uh, description here, we know there's four because when you read, you assume a certain kind of continuity. You assume the characters are going to stay the same and you assume they're going to be in the same place that you left them. And you assume that, you know, the, the world that's, uh, texts create worlds, literature create, it creates a world. And when something in that world suddenly shifts, you get disoriented and lost. And that's not really what's supposed to happen in storytelling. Um, uh, and so you're reading along, assuming that it's going to be, you know, this nice, continuous, coherent story. Yeah. And then suddenly, as in the Genesis 1, Genesis 2 thing, you're like, wait a second, I'm like in an entirely different world here with a different timeline and different characters in different places, mm -hmm. or even the same characters in different places. Uh, and that, like, that lurch in the text just happens to happen like four times, okay. right? So, uh, so there's, there's just four stark disparities in the style of writing that were identified, and then they were just yeah, kind of it's, arbitrarily it's not, it's, named. It's, it's not. It's not even. It's, it's not even the style. One of the things that I really like harp on is there are stylistic differences, but it's less about style and more about story. Okay. Right. When you read Genesis, when you read like the creation in Genesis one, and then the, the Adam and Eve story, it's not. It is true that their styles are different, but it's not the style that tipped, when you were reading, it wasn't the style that tipped you off that something was amiss. You went, wait a second, the, the peoples I thought were here ain't here no more, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, we're starting uh, you, over. Someone we're starting out. over, right? It's, yeah. it's as if I've started a completely different story. With I had the same experience with Noah. I was like, which bird is he sending out? Like where, right. why is, right. <laughs> how no, many and, animals? And, and, and Noah's the, like, that's the classic version because yeah. if you tried to read that story straight, it's, it's not chapter by chapter the way it is in creation. It's verse by verse. You're like, wait a second. He just sent, a, he's sending another bird. How many animals? Right? How long? Where's the water coming from? Right? Why is he killing the animals when he gets off the boat? Right? Like there's all of this, all the stuff that doesn't make sense in the story is a story, but all the bits, all, like the, the different bits connect to each other to form coherent stories. Just you need to separate them from each other. But why four and not Four, you know what I mean? Like how- Because there happened to be four. I mean- No, but like, like how do you know that there happened to be four? I guess is my question. Because like there's this stark disparity like within the chapters that's identifiable. Like I'll, gr I'll grant you that. But I guess what I'm struggling with is how you go from, you know, Genesis and then like through to Exodus and you say, okay, well, this piece of Genesis 1 and this piece of Genesis 13 and this piece of Exodus, these were all written by one. And like, cause it's not, or, or, or could you pull them all out and create one coherent string from each of the four? And that's how you knew is that. Okay. So they're that, like, that, well, that, that thing, that thing that you just said, okay. that's, that's the thing, right? It's Im imagine you had like, uh, like four, like strings that you had interwoven. Yeah. Like this right? and you that's, pull that's, one that's, out. That's, and that's what, great. that's what, that's what we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And at and some places, it's like really hard to tell them apart because they're like really, really tightly done. And at some places, you know, you get logs, nice long ones. You're like, oh, there, I can see them. Like I can see the, the continuity there. But, you know, you're, you're watching along and then like it disappears behind another one. Like the string disappears and like there's another color in front. But then it's like, oh, it came back. And I know it's the same string because it's the same color. So in place, of, in place of color here, just imagine plot. Okay. Right. Oh, there's the characters in the place where I left them. Oh, there's like the you know there there they are doing the same things there they are saying the same things there they are assuming the same sort of created world um you know uh how many you know uh, 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 silly examples like um in you know one of the stories uh uh rachel the you know matriarch uh, wife of jacob she mm -hmm. dies in childbirth right now she dies in childbirth giving birth to benjamin okay but, but then it's like weird that like a little bit later on, it seems really clear that she must still be alive. It's like, okay. oh, well, okay. that must be the picking up of one of, of a story that's not the one she died in. Right? <laughs> right. Um, and, then later, and then later on, Jacob's like, I remember when, when Rachel died in childbirth. And you're like, oh, well, I know which one that must be. Like it, 
So that's, it's for, not because we invented the number four and thought, well, it's like the gospels. That sounds great. Um, <laughs> though it is like the gospels and that's pretty great. Um, but it, it's for just because there aren't any more. Oh, that's an interesting because, statement. There, because, 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 you know, you go and you're like, you read Genesis one, you read Genesis two, you're like, oh, there's a new one. And those two just keep going for a, a while. Mm. And then somebody else comes in and you're like, oh, that's got to be a third. And then they just go. And then someone else comes in and you're like, oh, that's four. And then you're, and then you're done. Then you've reached the end and there's, only, and there's only four. So would you say that this is the predominant opinion of most scholars who are studying the Old Testament, that the documentary hypothesis, like, that's it. There's four authors. We know that there's four different authors and we, we're all basically behind it. Or would you, or are there theories? If you, that could, if you had asked me, if you had asked me this a hundred years ago, the answer would have I been I missed yes, my chance. Which, which would have been weird. It would have been a very okay. weird and, and, and amazing thing to do. Okay. Um, and I probably wouldn't have had a great answer then anyway. Okay. Uh, but a hundred years ago, that would have been the case. Okay. Basically, everybody everybody basically agreed with this, um, with the exception of, of people who objected on religious grounds. But like from okay. the academic scholarly community, this was pretty much accepted. And it remains pretty consistently taught mm -hmm. as sort of a basic way of understanding this, especially in America. Mm -hmm. um, there are pockets of academia, particularly in Europe, okay. um, where they have moved away from this way of understanding the text toward a much, much more complicated way. So if, you're hoping, <laughs> if you were like, oh, this is pretty complicated. Does anybody have a simpler explanation? The answer is no. This okay. is the simple one. Right. Uh, other explanations are more complicated. And to my mind, for that reason, probably a little bit less persuasive, because I like to think that a simple explanation that accounts for the evidence is probably probably more likely. And certainly I find this approach reasonably easy to explain and to show people I can sit, you know, I could sit down with anyone and the Bible and, you know, take an hour and I'm pretty sure I could show you why why one might think this. It might become uh, clearer. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, more complicated solutions are uh, more complicated. And I think uh, I, I find them uh, less persuasive. But what we're talking about here is not, uh, this, this is uh, academia and it's the humanities, which yeah. means we're not talking about absolute truths, right? We don't want to, we're not trying to replace like confessional, like notion of there is a single truth to be had out there mm -hmm. with like the academic version of there's a single truth to be had out there. Like a Bayesian so best guess sort of thing. Right. I mean, what we're talking about is what seems most probable given the evidence that we have since the evidence that we have is relatively, I mean, it's really, it's the book, right? It's the Bible. Yeah. There is no evidence outside the Bible for this. Right. There's no like we didn't there's no like we found one of the doc, one of the sources in the cave. There's no, you know, somebody there's no like uh, Moses left his autobiography uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't we don't have data. It's it's purely a literary analysis of the text. Um, but it's uh, it's a pretty compelling one, I think. Does seeing how it's all constructed together give any hints of. See how I can construct this? Because this is another thing that I, f I find fascinating. So we're saying that there's four different sources. And th so which means that there's probably like four different groups of people who had basically the same belief system, but like a, a different local version probably of these stories that, you know, that everybody's version of an event is going to be slightly different once mm -hmm. they get together, right? Especially mm -hmm. once they imbue it with their own cultural identity and their beliefs and their understanding of it. So how did they get all together and intermeshed into this? Or is that just a huge mystery? It's a big mystery. Huge is, it's not huge. It's a big mystery. Okay. It's a sizable mystery. Uh, we're guessing. Okay. Right? We're, we're guessing as to, as to the why. Right. Right. The how we can sort of talk about. I mean, we sort of can say how because, okay. again... How, take it. The how the how we can talk about because we see it on the page, right? Do you think mm -hmm. that that is 
enough liquid in that container? No. Nope. Or do you think that you could use a bigger one? <laughs> I drink it throughout the day. It's 44 ounces. I drink a couple of them of water throughout the day. It's good for you. Do you not? Are no, you not no drinking point. enough water? No, I'm, I'm, cer- I'm certainly not. But like, <laughs> that's that's more water than I've ever seen before. Um, uh, it's okay. Um, the how of how the sources were put together is, is like identifying the sources themselves, right? You just we look at the text and say, well, you know, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Right? So what can we say, right? It seems as if the sources were all like the primary thing was I'm going to put all these things in the best chronological order I have, I can. Okay. Right. So like nothing happens out of order. It's not like, uh, it's not like the flood comes before creation. Okay. Right. Even yeah. within the story, the flood, Obviously. right. It goes in order, right. Because yeah, they keep the go, narrative line. Otherwise it would yeah. be ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, otherwise it would it's be like nonsense. Adam. And then, you know, Noah or no, actually we'll put, we'll put Moses here first. And then, yeah. yeah. That wouldn't make sense. Right. All right. But even, all right. even, even within something like the, the flood story, you don't have like everybody died and then God said, I'm going to bring a flood. Right. It's, <laughs> yeah. right. It, but you do get creation and then creation, which is weird. But I guess that they're like parallel to that, each that, other. That is, that is the weirdest, that is the weirdest moment maybe in the whole thing. It's true. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to put it in chronological order. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems like there was a fairly strong desire not to change any of the text as much as possible. Okay. How do I how do I know that? Well, in part because I can tell, like the fact that I can see the sources suggests that somebody, I can see the sources because the Bible as we have it is full of contradictions and problems. Mm-hmm. And if somebody was like, I can do anything I want to this text, they might've cleaned it up a little bit. But instead we get the same thing told twice. We get repetitions in, in, in ideas, in laws, in like verse by verse, right? You read the flood story and it says, everything on earth died. And the next verse says, everything on earth perished. And you're like, I, did you, I, like you could have cut one of those and we wouldn't have lost anything. Yeah. So that in itself suggests that there was a, a preservationist tendency, right? I've got these four things and I want to keep as much of every single one of them as possible as I can. That makes sense. Or it wouldn't be as redundant as it is in places. It, right. It's redundant and it's contradictory, which, yeah. you know, if you could, if you felt, uh, you know, able to, to manipulate the text and make it flow better, you yeah. would, but the fact that it doesn't suggest that 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 wasn't uh, on the table. And that's so that's like that's the how okay. chronological order and keep as much as I can, and that results in weird things happening in the text, creation, the flood story, a million other examples. Um, so, but but we can we can talk pretty pretty well about the how. The when we can also do pretty well. Oh wow! Okay. Really? I know. Isn't that amazing? That is pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> how, how do we how do we know that? Because there's a moment even in the Bible itself mm-hmm. when texts start later texts, like texts that were composed, you know, sort of late in biblical chronology, okay. start referring to the Torah, start referring to the right to the whole thing, the Pentateuch, yeah. and start and start clearly grappling with the fact that it has contradictory stuff in it. Okay. Right. So you can see right the er, the first moments of interpretation of the Pentateuch come within the Bible itself as as some of these authors were like, well, you know, if we're going to observe this law, we got to do it according to the Torah, but the Torah's got like weird contradictory stuff in it, so right. I'll resolve it by like fusing this with that. You can see them doing the interpretive work of like putting together how do uh, I build this country. tabernacle? I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. Thank, thankfully, that that wasn't one of the. But you know, how do you celebrate holidays? Right, was is yeah. a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you you can you can see references to the Torah to the Torah to the text and people trying to start interpreting it. And that happens, you know, in, in biblical terms, it happens in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles, which are like the the latest. We're talking like fifth, maybe fourth century um, BC. Yeah. Uh, so. At the very least, it didn't happen after that. And it probably didn't happen a huge amount before that. So when did it come together? Maybe sometime around 400, maybe a little earlier, or a little, yeah, maybe a little earlier, somewhere in the fifth, fourth centuries uh, of BCE is, w- is when this must have happened. Okay. So I got that, I got the how, and I got the when. Everything else I'm not so sure about. The who I don't even, I don't even really try because it could have been anybody. Right. Uh, 
Clearly it was somebody who was educated, which narrows the field a lot. But since I don't know anyone's names from back then, it doesn't help me. Um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was Fred. Fred it's, did it. Doesn't I, it seem like it would be more than one person though? Because if you were just one individual doing it, why would you have this eye and mind towards preservation of other cultures specific even vernacular to the point of including redundancies and contradictions of something that would be your holy text too that, that like to me well, it seems like it must have been done by committee by people saying no we're well, not getting rid of that part that right. part's ours so, and 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 it may have been although uh it, it may have been i mean again we don't i have no way of knowing whether it was one person or mm -hmm. multiple people or happened in multiple stages although but what I can say is the process looks the same from start to finish. Okay. Right. So whether there was one person or many people, they, they seem to have followed the same basic principles of editing the whole way through. But in response to what you just said, um, can you imagine somebody taking the four gospels with all of their redundancies and mm -hmm. at times contradictions and saying, I'm going to take these four things and I'm going to turn them into one, one story. Right, like not a um, right, like not four separate versions of the of the Jesus story, but one Jesus story. But I'm going to keep all of the text in there, and I'm just going to smush them together, and I'll reorder if I have to here and there. But for the most oh, part, wow. I'm going to keep every word. Right. I don't. You're gonna, I don't know. If you, you could. Like you can conceptually <laughs> imagine such a thing, right? I can conceptually imagine. It wouldn't make a great deal of sense, but I guess that's the point that you're trying to get at: is that there would be. There... But, but the set that, it, right. The second point I'm trying to get at is such a thing exists. It was done in the second century. Oh, no way. CE, okay. Uh, by a guy named Tatian. It's called the Diatessaron. And it became a uh, like liturgical Bible text for Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Okay. So like what I'm suggesting, even one, like even if it was one person doing it, isn't crazy, crazy. Like, so you could, you could do it. Remembering the person who's putting these to, this together isn't any of these authors, right? So mm -hmm. it's somebody who's who's taking four pre-existing texts and saying, instead of four stories, we, we really ought to have one. I'm wondering we how it got to prevalence, one, like, though. Like to the point again? that, well, because you said that uh, then after that, you see other, like, I, I don't know if you would call it canon in the Old Testament, but other sources that, you know, made it into the Bible referencing back. Um, so obviously it was like instituted or like, I don't know what the word I'm searching for here is like, it was, it was yeah, it, seen it, it, as the thing and contained those contradictions and was widely adopted for some reason. Like that's a so weird yeah, it, mystery it, it, to me. It, it must, it must have achieved some kind of authority. Yeah. Within a community. Right. Right. Remember Remembering that the community of literate humans in ancient Israel, minimalistic, yeah, was like uh, was like the number of people like in this Zoom call right now, probably, right? Like right. it was uh, like it was you and me, um, and so right. We don't want to. We don't want to. When we say it became authoritative and it became influential, yes, I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to imagine that it's something like everyone in Israel was like had their copy of the Torah on their shelf, like we have our Bibles. Right, so, uh, the, like ninety-eight plus, probably percent of ancient Israel would have like no idea that this thing ever existed, or have any idea that its predecessors, like its its precursor source material, ever existed. Right, they were farmers and they were living their lives and doing their thing, and you know there were there were smart people and uh, not even smart, there were educated people, elite people in the you know in the temple and in the. Um, I guess only in the temple at that point, there was no, was no, was no king. So there was no palace, but you know, the, the very elite people in their very elite little societies, their ivory towers, if you will, um, who were like having squabbles about, uh, you know, what are, what are we doing? How are we doing this? And uh, everybody else was, was going about their, their life. So it's certainly plausible. Uh, in fact, unavoidable that this newly created text um, gained some sort of traction. But I wouldn't want to overstate it as being like it was then widely published for the ancient Israelite community to, you know, adopt in their homes. So I can see how it would be that that makes sense to me, because if there's only a small population of people who are literate and those people are also simultaneously the people who are in charge of disseminating the information about the faith, 
then whatever tax that they have and choose to utilize, that's people are just basically going to kind of trust that and don't have any other option because it's not like they can critique or question. But I can see from the standpoint of people who are, especially people who are looking for faith retention, perhaps, um, or are looking to see the Bible as this, you know, inerrant construction of God as opposed to construction of human could look at a, something like that and say, are you, so you mean to tell me that there was this one guy that was a flashpoint that created a paradigm shift. And now instead of four Bibles, there was only one. And ah, you can see how I, they I, would I, have I, I, that. I'd say, but I'd say, the, I'd say it even worse. There weren't four Bibles before that. Okay. How would you there's put four, it? There's just, <laughs> Let's just make it worse. Four, there's, just, there's just four texts, right? Okay. The Bible, the Bible doesn't become the Bible until you have a, you know, a community that says this is our, you know, that treats it like a Bible, right? It's not, it's not scripture. Uh, one of my, one of my colleagues makes a nice dis distinction between uh, literature and scripture. Okay. Um, uh, these texts were literature, right? Scripture happens only when a community deems something to be scriptural. And there's like absolutely no reason to think that any of the sources of the Pentateuch were considered to be scriptural they weren't written to be scripture mm -hmm. right? nobody nobody was like i'm gonna write the bible now <laughs> you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna write a bible in 2000 years from now they're gonna be reading it's like that's not that's not that's not what happens right so it's yeah it's people writing texts those texts are being used and copied and you know uh uh disseminated within small communities but they're not scripture right uh, they're 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 just they're texts they're stories I, um uh, and so, and so, when does it, it become scripture? And even when it's combined into one thing, it doesn't become scripture at that point. Okay. It only becomes scripture once a community says we are de we determined that this is our sacred text and it's unchangeable, and we have to we're going to live our lives according to it. And what that means is we better start interpreting the hell out of it because this thing is not legible, really, or you know, it doesn't make any sense as it as it stands. Right. And that's the whole history of. <coughs> Every of, of biblical interpretation is people looking at this text and being and saying, okay, how do we make sense of this not particularly sense? Okay, that makes yeah, that makes sense to me. I I want to know what's your so you gave an example. Well, you you alluded to you actually didn't give an example of people kind of grappling in the later part of the Old Testament with the the first five books and yeah. some of the disparities there. Do you have like a favorite example or one that's glaring? Oh that's yeah, interesting. I, I've got, I got okay. the one I go to all. The, I got the one I go to all the time. It's okay. just so good. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Um, so, as you can imagine, the thing that is most problematic in terms of contradictions in the first five books is not things like creation, because you you know that's problematic for us as readers, but uh, in lots of ways to get around that. But mm -hmm. problematic is is the practical stuff. Okay. Right? Law, laws that don't agree with the each how other. to live your life. Okay, now, stuff. how do how do I do this? Yeah. If I want to act according to this text, how do I how do I do it? Okay. So the issue is this: uh, if you want to sacrifice, if you want to do the sacrifice that comes on Passover, right, you're sacrificing the Passover lamb, right? Um, when you read the book of Deuteronomy and you get to the law about Passover, it says. Uh, and so it says, it says, you shall boil the lamb. That's how you're supposed to prepare it. You boil it. Okay. But when you read in Exodus, the law about the Passover uh, sacrifice, it says explicitly, you may not boil it, <laughs> or, eat it or, or eat it raw. It says, I mean, it says right out, you, it may not be boiled or eaten raw. It must be roasted in fire. Okay. Which honestly is tastier. So kudos to Exodus <laughs> for that. Okay. Who wants to eat so you have to lamb? find a way to combine water and fire. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. so, so what do you do? Mm -hmm. So now, now the author of the book of Chronicles, which is one of the, the last books of the, of the Bible, um, chronologically, of the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. uh, the author of Chronicles is telling the story of King Josiah, everyone's favorite king. Everyone loves Josiah. He was the greatest. And we are told that Josiah reinstated the Passover sacrifice after years of not being, having been correctly done. And Josiah has discovered the book of the law and Josiah uh, says, okay, we've got to do the Passover sacrifice. How is Josiah going to do it? 
So Chronicles tells us. Okay. And Josiah offers the Passover sacrifice. He boils it in fire. According to the law. How do you boil something in fire? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. They don't know. The point is, the point is they've taken the boiling from one law and the fire from the other. And they said, he, and like, it's as if they're, they know that people are going to like want to catch him out. Like, ah, I know you have to boil it and mm. it has to be fire. How did you do it? Right. Like it says both things, right. It's contradictory. And they're like, here's how he did it. He boiled it in fire. Just like the law says, <laughs> but like they've, they've combined the two things. It okay. doesn't make sense, but they've combined the two things into one, into one practice. Mm -hmm. And then they've labeled it as like, correct. As this, this is the right way to do it, which is to say they're recognizing the problem, the contradiction in the Pentateuch mm -hmm. and they're interpreting, right? It's not, that's not so different from somebody reading Genesis one and Genesis two and saying, oh, the first one is like spiritual creation. The second one is like material creation, right? It's just as made up, right? Like <laughs> that's not in the text. You made that up, but you're like, it's a, it's a thing to do in order to, in order to say, I know the text doesn't work, but I need the text to work because I need it to be practical or I need it. I have a principle of it needs to be like correct okay. or, uh, or sensible. I need, it, it, it can't just be, a jumble of contradictory stuff. How do I account for it? So I love that example. Um, it's it's hilarious. I love that example. It still doesn't funny. make sense. <laughs> no, 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 it's not about making sense. I, yeah. I love it because it's funny and because, and it's clear and they were and because it, de it it demonstrates the moment, right? The moment when people were like, he like this need. I need to recognize that like the law mm -hmm. says something. But also I recognize that the law says two different things. And now I need to sort of like put on my interpretive hat and adjust and fix it. Okay. That's fascinating. That's really, like, that's cool. And I can see people doing that even to a certain degree today, like as, as society shifts through time. Everyone does that. Today. Yeah. Like people start to reconcile their own conceptualizations of how to act and engage in society and, and see what is or isn't moral with interacting with people through different lenses. And then they look backwards to the, through like through the text of their faith and find ways to kind of wipe away so, like some of the, the more problematic things by focusing on some of the good stuff, because all of these texts are filled with both problematic stuff and good stuff. There's good stuff. Yeah, too. I mean, it's, 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 again, it's, it's, as you said, it's not very different from someone looking at, you know, the law in Leviticus 18, mm -hmm. that, like, you know, the, the line about, uh, you know, you shall not lie with a man as, as, as with a woman, right? right? Like the, the basic anti, the, the classic anti-homosexuality. Oh, I'd law. love to talk to you more about that if but, you have next. But I already started minutes. talking about it. So you don't hey! need to worry. Um, <laughs> Perfect. But like you, people look at that and obviously that doesn't mesh with a lot of people's current moral ethical positions. Right. And so a lot of, what a lot of people do as an interpretive practice then is say, well, maybe it doesn't mean actually that. Maybe it means something else. And actually, if you look elsewhere in the Bible, you see what look like potentially, um, you know, non-problematic, potentially queer relationships. Oh, like David. David. Jonathan yeah. is the classic, right? Um, but, you know, we recognize that there's this one, there's that one line. Mm -hmm. And then there's all this other stuff that I can, and I can I bring that other stuff in to soften this, right? To To make this look not as bad so that I can be, more comfortable with preserving the Bible as the authoritative scripture uh, that I, that I want it to be. That's really much the same interpretive move mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, eh, I got one author who thinks it's okay. And I got one author who thinks it's not okay. Right. Which is what's actually happening. Know, happening. Right. Exactly. It's, it's so interesting though, psychologically, because nobody today is grappling with how to boil their goat. Right. But people are still grappling. Have you ever goat. tried to boil a goat? Uh, I boil mine in fire, as as is indicated by the law. Yeah, so, <laughs> right, so, so you're not grappling because you figured it out. I figured it, it out. out. I figured it out. That's how I boil my goats. But like, no, real, really though, they're not. But people are still attempting to do these things. So you still see that 
ver like that form of humanity's attempt to harmonize scripture to this day it's still happening like if, right. pe if people were still writing about it and there was an addendum that was added on from like you know the next about 2000 years you would see those types of things still happening like humans haven't really changed that much when it in regards to interpreting the the books of their faith there's For sure there's and, evidence and, of and, them doing that reconciliation even then and I mean, and I, I I would say that you know I, you're you're speaking out of out of one tradition, but within you know traditional Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, this the same interpretive practices have basically continued all the way all the way down. That thing about like about boiling or you know yeah. how how do you take care of the Passover sacrifice? That is very much the kind of interpretation we see in the first you know five hundred six hundred years of um, of classical Jewish interpretation and. Continuing down to the, to the present, this is how you play with the text. It's um, it's understood that it's it's got contradictions and and problems, and it is our it is our interpretive duty to creatively solve those problems such that we can. Uh, I mean, because Judaism still has you know the practice thing going on, right? Yeah. Uh, Judaism still does, does the works part. Um, so uh, for for Jews who still are, are trying to practice according to you know something like something based in biblical ideas right the classical jewish mode of interpretation is to creative creatively problem solve right essentially so so it's not it's, so it's not it's not that nobody's it's not actually that nobody's doing it anymore you know most christians don't have to deal with the practical because y'all not y'all they all uh they all like threw all the laws out a long time ago but you know, there are still, right, Judaism still has them. I wonder if you find a cultural disparity with how people approach the text based on either their current faith or the faith they came out of, because I'm certain that, like, in this conversation, you can probably get hints of, like, latent Christianity in me because I was a Christian, right? So how I'm viewing it is still probably colored very much by how I viewed it while I was a Christian, whereas you were raised in an entirely different and practice a different tradition. So how you view the text would be entirely different just from a cultural perspective, which would change even how you talk about it or look to interpret it. Do you find though that there's serious disparities there and it does it frustrate you and why? <laughs> uh, there are disparities there to be sure. Okay. Uh, the, the, the general, the big picture is this. Christianity, I'm speaking in incredibly general terms, so nobody yell at me, right? Like nobody be like, not all Christians, I know. <laughs> sure, I know. Not all Christians. Not all we Christians. We both know, right? everybody knows. Right, yeah. not all Christians. Mm -hmm. um, Christianity has tended to look to the Bible and say, we want to distill from this text like the truth the yeah. one like the one clear you know absolute truth um and so christianity has doctrine and heresy right and it's it's different in different communities sure but like they're all like everybody's uh, seems to generally not all questions everybody seems to generally be on board with the notion of like what we're trying to discern from the text is the right thing, the true thing, the correct thing. There is the one thing in there and our interpretive job is to fit everything in, right? This is like my colleagues will call systematic theology, right? This is, yes. this is like cre creating a coherent system uh, out of the whole, out of the whole mess. Yeah, like this is a puzzle and it has to make one coherent picture. Like the pieces can't be piled right. on top of each other. And there, and there, Every piece goes there's, somewhere. There's, and there's one there's one consistent truth and yeah. one at least at least it's it's linear, even if it's evolutionary, there's a there's a linearity to it. Mm. Right. Like even if I understand that once they thought this, right, I can see the line where it came to it, it went like this and always ends in Jesus. Right. Um so that's like the 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 very general Christian interpretive approach. Yeah. What's the the one truth to get at here? And Judaism went like the very opposite direction and looked at the text and said, how many cool things can we find in here? Oh, interesting. Okay. And okay. essentially Jewish interpretation. Now, the Jewish interpretation as a whole is, uh, is dialogic, right? 
So one person says, I think that maybe it we should read it this way. And someone else says, I think maybe we should read it this other entirely opposite way. And so like traditional Jewish, the classic Jewish sort of commentaries and texts sort of follow, even when they're talking about practical things, even they're talking about like how to actually like do the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they'll say, you know, Rabbi so-and-so says like this and Rabbi so-and-so says exactly the opposite. And they're like, okay, but why does, why would the first one say it this? And they like work out all the, all the logic of it. Mm-hmm. They, okay. And then why did the other one say it? And they work out the logic of that. And at the end they go, okay, do we understand everybody's positions? Okay, next topic. Okay. Right? And there's no there's no need to They don't to go say, off and make their own denominations and they don't, then take they don't go off and make their own denominations. Right? They don't go make their own denominations and they also don't go, Boy, we, but who's right? Yeah. Right? That's not that's not the point. Mm-hmm. And that's that's when we're talking about the practical stuff when we're talking about you know, stories and narrative and uh, you know, non non-legal uh, non-practical things. Anything goes. Right. Five different rabbis can give the same five different interpreters can give the same can, can give completely different takes on, you know, any any given verse or story or moment. And they all just get collected together. So and so says this next per, next topic. So and so says this next one. So and so says this. I get five different things. We throw them all in the book and we go look at all the cool things you can think. And Judaism says explicitly every single one of those is basically Bible, right? Okay. There's the written, there's the, there's written text, which is the same always. And then every interpretation we can all come up with, uh, is like, uh, the, is like the, the oral, the oral Bible, the oral Torah. And, uh, and that's open to anything anyone could ever invent. And that sort of open-ended interpretation is for us scriptural. Okay. So, you know, so again, starting starting from a Pentateuch, a, a Bible that is problematic and contradictory and messy, uh, Christianity was like, I got to narrow that down, got to get it to like the one true point. And Judaism was like, let's just do more. Yeah. Like, let's let's make more of it. Like, look at all the, look at all the interesting things we can do and all the different like, you know, you use the puzzle uh, metaphor, yeah. right? Christianity is trying to make the puzzle work, and Judaism was like. I can make the puzzle be a giraffe and I can make the puzzle be like a big Ben and I can make the puzzle be uh, a cookie. And like, look at all the things fun? I can do with these pieces. Yeah. And, is, and like... isn't, and, and how much fun and how fun and, and illuminating is that? And these are every, and every one of those illuminates the text in a different way. And like, lets us see something else that's going on. That's possible in there. Judaism is about expanding possibilities uh, primarily. And that is super hard, right? I teach at a Christian divinity school. Yeah, I teach it. Right, I teach it. I teach it at the Yale Divinity School. So I'm teaching, you know, vast majority people uh, who are potentially going on to ministry, but certainly people from Christian backgrounds. And this just like pff, blows, like blows their minds when I say like Jews don't. Well, probably because they've they, also been taught that um, you need to evangelize, which doesn't seem that it like it's built into the structure that you're explaining. Like, not only yeah, so, are they trying to make that puzzle like fit, they're trying to say, also, you need to make this same puzzle in the same way that I'm making this puzzle. Yeah, we like, need to make the same puzzle. That's very well said. I, I will say, the, I, I will say, in defense of in defense of my school and my students, we we don't have a lot of that. It's a very ecumenical school, okay. and most and we're mostly talking about you know, uh, good good liberal uh, liberal minded uh, 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 Christians. And again, um, no, hashtag not all Christians. Me, me hashtag too. Hashtag not all Christians. <laughs> and certainly, certainly not, certainly not my yeah. school. I, you really don't get very much of that. Mm-hmm. But what you're saying is like, again, generally true, right? There's a, yeah. there's a sense. Of, there's and a the sense overall in, culture, I think that is. There's a sense, of, there's a sense in obviously large parts of Christianity that, you know, it's not just, it's not just that I think it's not just, it's not enough for me to say, this is true for me. Yeah. It has to be like capital T true universal. And if you don't agree Right, like that's why you get heresy and like all that mm-hmm. stuff. Like, you know, if you don't agree, you're going to hell. And um, you know, and I'm gonna enforce my beliefs on like all of that. Whereas, of course, you know, uh, Judaism has gotten by mostly by being like, we're just gonna we'll be over here. <laughs> just you guys, like, you, you, guys, you guys do your thing. You guys, you think whatever you want, and that's cool. Right, like this is just for us, and and like. You're welcome to. You want to hang out? That's cool, but like <laughs> whatever. Like yeah. and that's and that and that's different too. 
Yeah, I, I completely understand that. I'm, and out of respect for your time, we've been talking for basically an hour already. I will. There are a couple questions that people sent. I'm going to read some of those questions off and thank you very much. We're, we're not done yet, though. You're not quite free. You still have questions. Okay. And and I never stop talking. So you you may be one of the first guests that out-talked me, actually. I might have to get you like a crown and mail it to you. <laughs> I, I you'll, probably send, you'll probably send it to me late. <laughs> Just wait, sit by the door. It's on its way. <laughs> All right. So the first one is from Gnostic Informant. Um, it's like making a story with Luke and Matthew's genealogy of Jesus gets spliced together. Oh, sorry. With Luke and Matthew's genealogy of Jesus getting spliced together and Jesus now has multiple ancestors from the same generations. So I think that that, that was probably sent right back, uh, back when you were talking just before you mentioned um, yeah, but, the gospel. Right. But it, it, sure. But it's like, it's a great example because, again, right, in, in all both cases, we're talking about different authors who are telling basically the same story, but with their own kind of body of knowledge and their own traditional takes on it and their own context. And as you correctly said, local communities. Um, you know, the example I use all the time is if you ask somebody, like, like we all, we, I should say we all, you're Canadian. We all in this country, you know, can can talk, like are basically familiar with the outlines of the Civil War. Yes. Right. Uh, but if you ask somebody from Connecticut, where I'm from, and you ask someone from Alabama to tell you the story of the Civil War, mm -hmm. they're going to tell you like the same basic outlines, but a lot of the details, a lot of the emphases and probably the style are all going to be very different. Right. That's that's what we're that's what we're talking about. And and so the same the same thing is true of the of the the gospel writers who you know had a basic story that they were working with, but they tell it with different emphases and slightly different information. Information, right? Different, different, um, uh, you know, like genealogies and different facts and uh, timings and and all kinds of you know all kinds of stuff. And the same thing is true. Uh, genealogies is a good one, right? You read the genealogies right early in the Bible, Gen Genesis four and Genesis five have two parallel genealogies where like the names are mostly the same and sometimes There's they're in slightly different There's even different, different names order. for God, like. Or do you think, or is that something yeah, that, that I'm one, noticing that's weird? Like there's God has yeah, many that different one, names. That one's, that, that's like a semi-real one. Okay. Um, Why semi? It's, it's, well, because in, everybody, everybody in ancient Israel, every author knew that God had a proper name. Okay. Right. And, it, and it was Yahweh or something like that. That's right. Like, right. Or Jehovah, if you're. What about like El? Um, or. Ah. So I am, yeah. Israel's God is named Yahweh. Okay. Right. And when you want to address Elohim. God by God's proper name, you say, hey, Yahweh. Okay. And when you talk about God, you use the word for God, just like we do. Okay. Right. Um, but we need to remember right, God is not a proper name. That's not anyone's name. It's a title, right? Right. That's, that's, that's God, right? That's, that's the president. Right. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, but, you know, if you were to talk to him, you'd be like, hey, Joe. Right. right. Um, right. Uh, so Elohim is just a title and Yahweh is a proper name. And actually, this is one of the things, there's so much to talk about, but that's one of the things that like we've all, lots of people have lost over the last 2000 years because nobody thinks about Yahweh as a proper name anymore because it's always translated the Lord. Right. And the Lord isn't someone's name. Right. Yep. But every time you read the Lord in your Bible, that's somebody using a proper name. Right. Okay. That's someone being like. Joel or Fred. Um, uh, so everybody knew Yahweh was his name and Elohim is his title. And El is just a shortened version of it. Like it's another version of the word God. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, and, and the other thing you see sometimes in the text, especially in Genesis is uh, according to the stories, according to some of the sources, God didn't reveal his proper name until, until he started talking to Moses. So in those stories, they don't use God's proper name because they didn't know it. Okay. But the authors and all of the author's readers all knew, right? Like that the person, the, the deity they keep referring to in Genesis is Yahweh. He just hasn't told them his name yet. So it's a little bit, so it's, that's more in the level actually of like plot and story. That's a way of, of telling the story. So that the means that part. the writers knew that that was the point in the narrative when God introduced himself formally and made sure well, that they, they didn't knew. incorporate that in previous stories until the big reveal. 
So that because it had they impact. were writers, right? Like if you were writing a story in which somebody didn't give their name away, you wouldn't screw it up, would you? No, no. Mm -hmm. If I was writing right. a story, but I think like this goes back to the, the latent Christianity way of per perceiving the Bible to me, which is that this isn't a story. Like this is the truth. So like it takes yeah. me a minute to grapple with it because I'm deconstructing it. Still, yeah. I'm still deconstructing the way that I view yeah. it. It's a, it's a, it's a story, right? It's a, even if it's, you could call it a history, right? Even if you, if you say, I think that they think that they are giving an account of the past as they understand it. Yeah. It's the form is still narrative. It's still story. And if they're, if they believe. Are you saying Moses you, didn't write it? La, 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 <laughs> If you get, I mean, if, if you, you can use the term, if they believe what they're writing to be true, but they believe that God didn't reveal his proper name until he told it to Moses, mm -hmm. then they're going to they're gonna write it that. that way. Yeah. Right. Because they, they were good authors. I mean, they were legit literary artists, you know? Mm hmm Cool. What do you think about people who, and that there's more questions and now I'm just being selfish, but I don't care. <laughs> so, what do you think about people who look at the different naming conventions of God and say, okay, well, that means that there was external influences. That means that there was, you know, a God in this maybe version of the, well, I, I'm going to try to get away from version of the Bible there in this literary source. Is that a better way of saying it? In this literary source, there was this name for a God. And in this literary source, there was this name for a God. And then when they got woven together, they had to have the cultural influences from maybe even polytheistic aspects of the community woven into the Bible in order to make it mesh with monotheism. I've heard that one. What do you think about that? I don't know what I think about it because I don't know enough about it, but I've heard it. I'm trying to figure out what it meant. That uh, means that like say... in local community, I'll explain better. Give me a sec. So like in local communities, there would be like maybe a monotheistic element that, you know, a y Yahweh or whatever they called him, but they saw him maybe as part of like a pantheon. Sure. And that, so not monotheistic. Yep. Yeah. But there, but there was like leaning towards a monotheistic element and they were trying to marry them together in the Bible to kind of push it towards monotheism. Like, yeah. <sighs> I would say this. Just in very general speaking terms. Okay. Uh, we want to distinguish the history of the development of Israelite religion mm -hmm. and the text. Right? Okay. We shouldn't, we have a tendency, we have a really strong tendency, and it makes a lot of sense to read the Bible, its sources, whatever, and to say, what can I learn from this about the history of Israelite religion? That's totally legitimate. We all like that's a super standard and absolutely understandable move. Right. What can I learn about Israelite religion from this? But then we make the mistake of thinking that the biblical authors were writing in order to teach us about Israelite religion. Right. Which yeah. of course they weren't. Right. right. Um, in the same way that, you know, I could you know, pick up Shakespeare and be like, what can I learn from this about Elizabethan like culture? Okay. Without without thinking that Shakespeare's intention was to preserve for posterity a record of Elizabethan culture, right? Like he does because that's what he's writing out of, but that's not the point, really. Right. Like we can, we can ask those questions, but we shouldn't mistake our questions for the intention of the text. Having said that as a, as a initial sort of caveat, uh, it is absolutely the case that the history of Israelite religious thought or ideas of God is absolutely like permeated with ideas that have been brought in from other religious cultures. Okay. Uh, there are, there's Canaanite, you know, divine elements in their understanding of God. There's Egyptian stuff. There's plenty of Mesopotamian, right? There, right, Israel was this like tiny little nothing place in the middle of all these major cultures. And they absorbed all this, all, all their culture and all their religion from, from everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, you find all, all sorts of things, right? The references to, um, you know, when in the patriarchal accounts in Genesis, they're like, ah, this, I'm the God of your father, right? The God of your father is like a title um, that was used in sort of very ancient local communities for like our ancestral deity, right? The, it had, didn't have anything to do with Yahweh. It was just like, it was the local God. Um, so you, this is all, this, all this stuff is sort of brought in and it's all imbued into, into ancient Israel's concept of, of God or concepts of God. Okay. But 
for the most part, by the time we get to the literary sources and texts that make up the majority of the, of the Hebrew Bible as a whole, not just the, the first five books, but most of it, there is a pretty common understanding that Yahweh is Israel's national deity, right? And that, and, and they know that every other nation has their national deities. Okay. And so it's not monotheistic. It's just, uh, it's like, it's, the, it's, on the mo- it's on the model of, um, of kingship, right? Uh, I live in this country, in this nation, and, and that's our king. And so I have to be respectful and obedient and follow the laws of my king. But you guys over there, I know you have your own king with your own laws, and you do that. Like, that's fine. Um, and that's but they like, see them as both existing, like in a tangible way. Yeah, yeah. Does, like, oh, my wow. king exists. My king exists and that king exists. Okay. And my God exists and that God exists. And that's fine. Um, Interesting. And, and so it's, it's, right, it's, it's the worship of a single God, mm-hmm. right? It's loyalty to a single God, like loyalty to a single king. But without negating the existence of other peoples and having their own gods. The problem for the, you can see this, the problem for the majority of the Hebrew Bible is not that uh, Israel is, uh, thinks that there are maybe other gods. The problem that is like, when the Bible is like, hey, stop doing this. They're not like, hey, stop thinking that there are other gods out there. The Bible is always yelling, hey, stop worshiping other gods. You owe your worship to me. Right. It uses, it uses the metaphor of, um, of uh, extramarital affairs, right? Okay. We were married and then you went and slept with this other God, right? Like for that metaphor to work, there has to be another God, right? Cause like a husband can't be like, accuse his wife of cheating if there's no other dudes in the world. You know what I mean? Like there have okay. to, so there com- there does come a moment in, in sort of the, his- the produ- production of biblical thought there comes a moment when monotheism actually pops onto the scene, but it's not until relatively late, um, chronologically. Okay. And so, I mean, it's certainly in the, in the, um, for the most part in the Pentateuch and in most of the Bible, um, what you're looking at is not monotheism at all. Uh, it's what we call monolatry, right? The worship, the worship of a single God. And so, you know, they understand we worship Yahweh and they worship whoever they worship, but their understanding of Yahweh, to go back to your original question, mm-hmm. their understanding of the character of Yahweh, of their deity is, you know, probably even totally unconsciously, right? a jumble of all kinds of, you know, practices and ideas and beliefs that they've absorbed from, uh, from their, their neighbors, which, you know, I realize doesn't doesn't sound awesome for lots of folks, but like, like I'm not really an expert on this, but I'm pretty sure Jesus is the same thing. Like, I kind of agree with you on that. I don't like, <laughs> like, like it's it's got it's got some like He's an amalgam. Jewish stuff. It's got Jewish yeah. stuff in it. It's got Greco Roman stuff in it. There's some pagan stuff in it, right? Like, it's a mishmash of all of their cultural stuff. That's like how. Anyway, that's a different. That's a different topic. <laughs> you just um, my chat's probably going. Right now. Yeah, well, um, yeah. unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Bye. No, okay. That <laughs> no. was one. That, that was one question. That was one question. That, that I know, well. and we have more. Yeah, we're doing great. I have a question for you before I ask. More about <laughs> I do. You are selfish. I that's am absurd. insanely selfish. I know. My, my it's okay. My my viewers know that I'm selfish. They love me for it, right? Um. This is something that's always bothered me. And I like, you don't have to answer me right now. I get it. Like, you can just tell me to frig off and I'll go back to the, the audience questions. But this is something that's always bothered me. And this was like a linchpin of deconstruction for me when I was like reconciling morality. And it was the passage in Numbers that's the test for the unfaithful wife. Yeah. That one was rough for me because I was very like against abortion. And I was like, but wait a minute. If somebody basically owns me and they leave town and they think I may have cheated. They can make me drink tabernacle dirt water and force me to miscarry if I like, but I've been told that I'm interpreting that wrong, that that actually was not a miscarriage. That was not, that was not meant for to be understood as God causing a miscarriage. That means that the thigh is rotting and that the punishment was just the thigh rotting. But then it follows by saying yeah. that then she would be a burden to all the land and would be barren for all her days. So my question then became, well, if she was pregnant and she didn't miscarry, does she have the baby? Which means that she didn't get caught and then is barren for the rest of it. Like, how does that? 
Anywho, I just wanted to get your take on that passage, if you're familiar with uh, it. You said, you said it right the first time. Okay, thank you. Because yep. I've been told by, you know, counter-apologists... By, by, pe- by, of... people, by, by people for whom it is important that the biblical text not say that. Yeah. Because it yeah. seems so clear as day to me. It's pretty clear. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's not pretty clear. It's a very weird, difficult chapter. But you summarized it, like, very, very neatly. That's ex- it's, you, what you said is exa- exactly right. It's exactly right. I feel very affirmed and, now. <laughs> and the only re- the, and, 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 and the, like, we want to say, like, why, why think it says something else? Because you and the need reason God. Because, 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 because I'm anti-abortion, right? Like, if you're anti-abortion, that's why it's important that it not say that. And you end up coming up with, like, whatever nonsense the thing was you said. It caused the thigh to rise. Yeah, no, 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 that's not a thing. Like, what's that? That's not, like, that's not a thing. <laughs> what? But, like okay. what was it like? <laughs> as, if, like as if like she was a marathoner and like this is the worst possible thing that can happen. Right, and then makes her no, infertile. I, yeah. Okay. No, Thank you. you. you I got, feel better. You got it right. I feel better. I feel affirmed because so, sometimes, especially when you're not a scholar and you're just like entering into these discussions to have you know conversations and work through these thoughts, you encounter people in you know my I wouldn't want to say line of work, but in my in my foolish hobby that I do, which is this that are very, very ardent and have and spend a lot of time researching and they come at you with all of these like counter apologetics and apologetics about, you know, research and how the languages work and you don't, they can start to spin you a little bit, but yeah, anyway, I just, thank you. I feel affirmed. So I will, I will let the audience answer, ask questions again. Uh, Josiah Hansen uh, just had a comment that said, that is exactly my dad's apologetic books. One one big GOS. I don't know what that means, but I think it was probably in context at the time. Oh, Apologia. Apologia would like to ask you, do you buy the notion that two sources were Southern Kingdom slash Northern Kingdom divergences later restored with the nation? I know what that meant. Did you? No, I have no idea, but he'll (laughs) tell me what he's in the living room right now. So he'll tell me when I'm done. I'm sure. (laughs) Um, uh, so you know this this goes to the question of what can we say about the sources themselves and where they're from and and when they're from and you know the context that they're writing in we talked about this actually with with who might have put them together mm-hmm. uh, but not so much about them themselves um what i would say is there are a number of mild reasons to think that you know we have at least one source that is from the Northern kingdom of Israel. You have to know your Bible to know what the hell that means. But right. The, the Israel is split into two, right? Uh, the he Northern was a kingdom, Bible quizzer. He knows his Bible. The, the Northern <laughs> kingdom and the, and the Southern kingdom. Um, and there's reason to think that one of the sources may have come from the Northern kingdom. It seems to have a lot of, uh, you know, sort of like resonances with other texts that from there and, um, Fine. Uh, and, you know, and it certainly seems that at least one, if not all of the other texts may be um, from the, the southern kingdom from, from Judah. And it is, it's not the case, it used to be thought that it was the case that when the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 BC, that it's, we know that the inhabitants of the north moved south because their kingdom just got blown to pieces. So they moved south into Judah and into Jerusalem. And people used to think, ah, so that's the moment when that northern version of the story and the southern version of the story got fused into one version, into into sort of one one text. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, That northern version and that southern version did end up in the text, but I don't think they got like combined in that moment when the the northern kingdom was destroyed. I think they all got combined uh, essentially in the exile um, uh, 150 or so years later. That was a very specific question to a very, a very specific answer to a very specific question. And I apologize to everybody else. Um, He'll be but, happy and I have to live with him. I, so. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here to make the person in the living room happy. <laughs> He'll probably be very happy. I don't hear him cheering, but I'll, 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 I'll let you know how he feels afterwards. I saw somebody tag me. I think Nathan had tagged me in a question from Digital Gnosis and I didn't want to miss that because usually it's a good question. Uh, yes. So digital gnosis, what does Dr. Baden think of various Christian philosophers who have interpreted the tetragrammatron? I 
Tetragrammaton. <laughs> Better. Was I even Tetragrammat- close? Tetragrammatron, Tetragrammatron is, 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 is like, like a, a transformer. It's a transformer. It's a transformer. That's right. It's Megatron's very religious brother. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As, some kind of, <laughs> as some kind of statement of analytic philosophy about God's necessary existence. Do you want me to start again just to hear me try to pronounce that again? Uh, no, I don't. No, it? it's like I, my feeling is that uh, people who want to interpret things in ways that use all those big words, uh, can do whatever they want as long as they don't pretend that that's actually what the text itself was trying to do. Okay, fair enough. And we're does that make sense? Like, I, I, I think that makes sense. We're. I want to be clear. Like, we are at liberty as Jews and Christians and analytic philosophers and whatever. You know, everyone is at liberty to interpret the text in whatever way makes sense to them in their interpretive community. So, you know, I'm not bothered. For example, I'm not bothered when you know, Christians look at a, a story like the sacrifice of Isaac and look at that and, and, and say, uh, this is really about, I think I like, I read the story as being about Jesus. That's not, doesn't bother me, right? That from a, within a Christian framework in which the Old Testament is part of the larger story that leads to Jesus and, and, and includes the New Testament, it makes sense to interpret those texts as, you know, be, as being meaningful to a Christian community. It's just important to not think that the text was written about Jesus, right? Like we can do all kinds of interpretive work. <coughs> Excuse me. We can do whatever interpretive work makes sense for us within our various interpretive communities. It's just being able to recognize that we're the ones doing those interpretations, right? That's not the plain meaning of the text, nor the intention of the text, nor the universal meaning of the text. So, you know, if somebody wants to take the, tetragrammaton right that's the, that's, <laughs> i liked that's mine the, better for the record <laughs> that's, that's, that's yhwh YH, right yahweh the that's the, like the name of yahweh as as written out in the text mm-hmm. and and make all kinds of you know you can do whatever you want with that you know you can turn it into you know you can like make a little puzzle and like make a picture out of it i don't know um as long as you're not as long as you're not like i think the intention of the authors of the bible was for me to make this picture right that's that's all. So you would say probably that you don't personally see it as a strong piece of evidence then by the sounds of it, but you can see how you don't care if people use it that way. That's what I heard, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my feeling is interpret, interpret away as long, as long as you're open about the fact that you're interpreting something that isn't the same. Like, if you're interpreting it, then the it isn't your interpretation, right? You're, you are interpreting it. So this is your interpretation and this is the it. They're not the same thing, right? And that's that's the important part. Okay, fair enough. And somebody else just sent a question. So you, you almost got away. You were, you were that close. I, was, I just kept on talking too long. <laughs> Serves you right. So please ask him if the book, this is from Hotel Yugoslavia. Please ask him if the book of Genesis is a sort of rewrite of some Babylonian religion. And I think we kind of covered that a little bit. So the short answer is the book of Genesis isn't. But there are absolutely parts of Genesis that are. Um, I don't know that I would say a rewrite of, but uh, you know, we're talking when we read Genesis one, we're reading an Israelite version of a Babylonian creation myth. When we read the flood story, we're reading an Israelite version of a Babylonian flood story. When we read the story of the birth of Moses, we're reading an Israelite version of a Babylonian birth story, like birth legend. That, that stuff is happening all over the place. Um, again, a reminder that Israel and the Bible didn't exist in a vacuum. They belonged to a, a whole culture and world, a larger, uh, you know, communities that they that they were a very, very small part of and influenced by people all around them. Um, and so it's not, it shouldn't be at all surprising, right? When we read, there's like three chapters in Proverbs that are essentially verbatim from an Egyptian text from like, a millennium earlier, right? That, there's nothing weird about that. Um, unless there's you something think, weird about that, unless you see yours as the story, like right. That's but, when you see it as weird, I think. Right, but you know, outside of that, <laughs> <laughs> but if you outside don't. of that, very, outside of that, very common belief. Mm. Um, no, it's uh, so yeah. It's absolute, absolutely the case that there are lots of parts of the Bible that are. Israelite versions of stories, of myths, of laws, 
that uh, originated in Babylonia uh, or in Mesopotamia mm -hmm. and, you know, became part of the broader cultural heritage of the region. And uh, Israel picked them up and reused them for its own purposes. Sure. All right. You're free now. We've, we've hit our last question and I'm going to stop being selfish, especially since I made you start late, as we all know. And you were gracious I, enough I to do aware. it anyway. <laughs> you were gracious enough to do it anyway. So I appreciate you. And if anybody would like to check out his Twitter, it's fire. <laughs> You're fire. going through, it is fire. You're going through uh, the Old Testament. Like I'm not, no, 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 no. No. I'm not going through the whole thing. No, I'm, well, going through, I'm, I'm going through the Pentateuch. You're going through the Pentateuch. Okay. You're going through the Pentateuch. Kind, not quite verse by verse, but Basically. like in, in, in order, chunk by chunk. And you just did slavery. I'm, 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 and I'm I'm a year and a half in, I'm a year and a half in, and I'm almost at the end of of Leviticus. Uh, it's so I good. so I think I think it's going to be a two and a half year project, but you can find it all on my Twitter feed. And what's your Twitter handle for those who might not know? At Joel <laughs> underscore Baden. Yes. And that's my Twitter handle. Yes, go find it. I'm pretty sure. That, yeah, it is. Is it, underscore? <laughs> is, 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 is it underscore? I don't know if it is. Oh, maybe it's not. I, do, Hold on, I, I shared it on mine. Now you have to go look. It's not. Underscore. It's not underscore. It's just oh, at no. Joel Baden. It's not underscore. I'm okay. I've been on Twitter before. I probably know what my handle is. It's at Joel Baden. There you go. I confused mine. I don't know if I have one. If anybody Joel logged Baden. off before I fix it, I'm in real trouble. <laughs> and I love so that fine. you just finally got to slavery too, because I'm like, oh, now he's going to get I it. Know. Everyone, was waiting. <laughs> Everyone was waiting for slavery. But now he's going to get it. I got there and we're past it. You did it. All right. Well, thank you so right. much for being here. My pleasure. And I am going to thank also the audience for, for sticking with us and listening to this fine gentleman share all of his knowledge with us and as that's always, not all of my knowledge that's really insulting that was a very small part of my knowledge i thought it was all but i mean okay we'll see it's so, it's so disappointing. plus what you have on twitter that's all i know I'm <laughs> that's, that. it. I'm out. that's it that's everything about the well is dry okay. <laughs> all right and as always everyone help elevate the discourse bye